Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a new Zor Education. Um, let's continue this course of advanced mathematics for teenagers and high school students presented on unizor.com. That's where I suggest you to watch this lecture from because there are very important notes, very detailed notes for each, le uh, for each lecture. Plus, you, if you are a registered student, you can take exams and it's all free. So, the today's lecture is about a particular example of a um, test for uh, distribution of certain random variable to be uh, normal. Well, first of all, why is it important for any variable to be uh, normal? And in general, why is it important to know its distribution? Well, let me start from the second part. Well, obviously, Theory of probabilities allows us to predict the values with certain level of certainty of random variables which we are not really 100% sure about what kind of value it will take. So if we know the distribution of probabilities, we can say that with certain degree, certain uh, uh, probability level, we will have the, uh, the value within certain range, right? So that's general purpose. Why normality of the distribution is important? Well, normal distribution is very well researched. Um, there are many very nice theorems about normal distributions uh, which allow us to um, predict the future results of certain experiments if we know beforehand that these distributions are normal. There are only two parameters we need to, de uh, to, to, uh, to define um, the normal distribution, which is uh, mathematical expectation or mean and uh, variance or square root of variance, which is standard deviation. These two parameters are sufficient to completely define um, the, uh, all the probabilities related to random variables. What's also very important is that a lot of random variables which we um, deal with in, in real life, they are actually normal. And the reason for this is, um, well, the reason is certain natural phenomena, but uh, mathematicians would love actually to say that the reason is the central limit theorem. Well, central li limit theorem just reflects the way how the, the nature is working. Um, uh, and uh, it basically says that if you have a lot of different factors contributing to the, the, to the value of the random variable, well, the more factors contributing, the closer the distribution will be to normal, under very, very broad um, uh, conditions. So it's no wonder that lots of, uh, and lots and lots of different random variables which we meet in real life are actually almost normally distributed. Nothing is absolute, obviously, but it's as close as it's theoretically possible to prove, let's put it this way. And one of the examples which I um, presented to you in some other lecture was the temperature of a, a human body when it's a normal, healthy body. It's not always exact, the temperature, it's, there is a certain range, and within this range we still have this normally distributed random variable with its maximum at certain point like 37 Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit and there is a certain well-shaped curve, uh, curve around this mean value um, which basically um, reflects how all the different normal, uh, normal temperatures are, are distributed. Now, in this particular lecture, I would like to touch yet another natural phenomenon and um, I will try to basically determine whether its uh, distribution is normal or not normal. So that's the purpose. The test for normality, if you wish. Well, normality, <laughs> normality not in the medical sense, not in the psychiatric sense. It's just normality in the theory of probability sense. All right. So, what exactly I'm going to research? Well, I wanted to research the sea level at certain point um, uh, uh, on Earth, and uh, I needed to know basically some statistics. 
So I found the website and I basically in my notes on the website on unizor.com I present information uh, about the website which is the source, it's uh, University of Hawaii and uh, in particular they have accumulated an hourly sea level um, at many different points. I chose the point which is Midway Island in Pacific Ocean and um, the data which I have accumulated from uh, which they accumulated and I took from that site was hourly sea level during uh, three years 2012, 2013 and 2014. So altogether I have hourly rate which means every hour every day of the year three years in a row which amounts to about 26,000 plus entries, which I have 26,304 26, to be exact. So it's a lot of data. I mean, 26,000, it's a lot of data. Now, my approach to basically uh, suggesting that this particular distribution of the sea level is or is not normal, um, basically is um, it's, it's based on two criteria which I have um, presented in the previous lecture about the methods uh, of the normality test. The first is histogram. It should be well shaped. And the second one is to check these one sigma, two sigma and three sigma rules. So that's what I did. Now, I've got the raw data from this website of the University of Hawaii. Every hour on the hour I had 26,000 plus different um, measurements. Now, I used the spreadsheet to basically construct the histogram uh, uh, of this data and um, some calculations as well. So, my first uh, point in research is have some general um, sample data from this whole set, which are minimum, maximum, uh, mean, um, sample variance, and sample standard deviation. So these things. So here is what happened. My range from minimum to maximum was from 660 to 1859. I think it's millimeters from certain level. I, I don't remember exactly what it is, doesn't really matter. For us, it's just numbers, all right? So the level of the sea was measured on the minimum, 660, maximum, 1859. Okay, now the mean value was 1125. My um, standard deviation was 142. And, as I said, the total number of points was this. So, I've got these raw data, and I have calculated minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation using um, spreadsheet. By the way, I'm not sure what's your particular preference of uh, what kind of tools you use to calculate these things. If you have 26,000 something um, uh, elements of data, I don't think you can avoid using a spreadsheet. And I understand that some of you might not actually be used to this. So, well, just take whatever I'm saying for, for granted. Just trust me. That's the way what I did. However, if you would like to, um, to do it yourself, that would be a great exercise. Anyway, so that's what my first step is. Now, my second step is, we have to build histogram. Now, how can we build histogram? If you remember, the best, the best way to approach this is to take this range from maximum to minimum, or from minimum to maximum, divide into certain bins, and calculate how many elements of data fall into each bin. So, what I did was, I had 26,000 plus and I had decided to uh, have 30 bins. It will be relatively representative graph, rep relatively representative histogram. So, 
That's exactly what I did. Um, now, if I have 30 bins, my difference between these is something like 100, 1200, something like this, right? Plus or minus. Um, divided by 30, so it would be 40 uh, the width of the interval. So it's from 660 to 700, from 700 to 740, etc. Up to 1860, I guess. That's my maximum. Would be. So these are my bins. Now I'm calculating how many of these fall into this category, to this category, this, 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 and this. And I had numbers, something like one here, one here, then it would increase, and uh, somewhere in the middle, it was really um, largest, it was 2000 something. Um, and at the end, then it was diminishing again, and at the end it was also like two and one, something like this. Which means, if I will build the chart based on these numbers and these intervals, I can actually see my histogram, right? Because the histogram is a frequency. I used, by the way, the, the function frequency in uh, spreadsheet to calculate these data. As soon as I have these intervals, I can calculate the frequencies. There is a function on spreadsheet. And then, once I had the frequencies, uh, I can build the chart. And the chart looked like... So that's my 660, that's my 1859. And my chart really looked like this. Obviously it was bars here, right? Which obviously resembles the bell shape. So my histogram test was positive. Okay, this is really the distribution really looks like normal distribution. My next test was, well, I know that with normal distribution, the probability of normal, normally distributed variable to deviate from, uh, sorry, to deviate from the mean value by no more than 3 sigma is 0 0.97 no, more I think it's 99 99 and then something else 997 I believe yeah, 997 997, which is 99 0.7%. So, within 3 sigma, from my average, from my mathematical expectation, a uh, random variable will be in 997 uh, cases out, uh, out of each 1000 on average. Now, in this particular case, um, my 3 sigma, okay, 2 sigma is 2, 4, uh, 284, right? I think it was actually 285 because there was some rounding and the 3 sigma was 426 uh, or 27, something like this, including rounding. So, let's say this is 3 sigma. Now, my mean value is this one. So, minus 3 sigma and plus 3 sigma, right? Difference should be less than 3 sigma. So if I subtract, I will have uh, 1100 minus 400, that's what, 700, right? Plus or minus, well, 698, right? And plus 3 sigma would be uh, 1552, 1552. So this is a very, very wide interval, considering this is my maximums. So this one is very close to this, and this one is maybe doesn't seem to be very close, 
but as far as frequencies are concerned you see everything above this was really very very few most of them will be narrower than that so I have calculated basically what is the frequency of my um, data my 26304 so the number of these was uh, 26 to 23. 26 to 23. You see, almost everything went within this uh, interval. There were cases above this and and below this because these are real minimum and maximum, but very very few. Like in this uh, case, what what do we have? Like 80 of them or something like this. So only 80 cases, only 80 um, measurements were outside of this. And this number, relative to this, is actually 0 0.9969. As you see, it's very close to theoretical value, how it's supposed to be. Okay, 3 sigma is fine. Let's check the 2 sigma. Now, the 2 sigma... The two sigma, two sigma. Um, it's about 0 0.925 in theory for a normally distributed random variable. Now, what do I have? Now, this is my two sigma. So, um, mu minus two sigma would be what? Um, so, it's uh, 925. 920, 840, right? I think it's 840. It's 1020, yeah, something like this. Uh, and plus would be uh, 13, 14, 10, right? Okay, this is a narrower interval. It's only two sigma interval around my uh, mean value. So lesser number of uh, data elements should fall into this because, you know, there are something outside. Now, the number of these guys was uh, 25625. 25625. And if you divide it by this number, by the total number of data elements, you would have 0 0.9605. Okay, so my theory, my theoretical number is 0.95, my actual 0.96, which is relatively close, so we are okay on this. And finally, a, sing, uh, a single sigma, single sigma, which is which has theoretical value 0 0.68. Now, in this case, it's even narrower than this. Sigma is this, so it's um, uh, 983, is that right? 1125 minus this, yeah, looks like Eight, nine, 983, right. And the plus would be 1267. Okay, so it's even narrower range around my um, mathematical expectation. And in this case, my number of data elements which fall within this range was... 1765, 17651, which is relative to this number, 0 0.6710. Again, theoretical is this. This is my sample value, relatively close. I mean, one hundredths difference is really kind of normal thing, which means that all these 
four tests. The first one is if my um, histogram resembles the bell shape curve of the normal distribution with a single maximum, the curvature on the top there is a hump and then the cur curvature goes this way um, uh, it's concavity up on the sides and concavity down in the middle, right? Okay, so that's my first test. And then my three tests related to standard deviation. Single, double and triple standard deviation supposed to be 0 0.68, 0 0.95 and 0 0.997, whatever. And they all did actually have more or less the same numbers, approximately. Which means that this is basically a very good indication that the sea level is a random variable um, which basically um, has this standard, uh, this uh, mathematical expectation and this standard deviation. Why do we need it? Well, for instance, using these uh, data, we can basically predict what is the probability of the flood or something like this, depending on whatever, wherever our structure, for instance, or, or a city street um, level is located. So we can definitely have certain probability, and having the probability, we can evaluate our, our risk, so to speak. So we can have certain amount of damage, for instance, if uh, uh, if, it, if it's down by the flood, um, we basically multiply it by the probability and we have something like um, mathematical expectation of the damage and then we can somehow um, uh, handle the situation, either allocate certain amount of funds to build the wall or something like this, so whatever it is. So these um, calculations are very important to number one, determine um, the distribution of the random variable, and in this case, it's um, kind of convincing ourselves that this is a normally distributed random variable. And since we know that this is normally distributed random variable, determined mathematical expectation and um, standard deviation allows us to make certain prediction for the future behavior of this variable, how the sea level will be in the future. Now, of course, everything is different. Uh, things are changing. Uh, the wind is a contributing factor. Um, the uh, currents, the ocean currents, are contributing factors. Um, rain or no rain or whatever else. I mean, there are many different factors which basically influence the uh, level of the water, the sea level, uh, in this particular case. And precisely because these factors are so numerous, I mean, the whole you know, climate of the Earth actually is a major contributing factor, and how many factors really make up the climate. Even the volcano mm, uh, eruption might actually change something. So there are a huge number of factors, and precisely because of that, and central limit theorem, we are not surprised that many um, real natural random variables occurring in real life are actually normally distributed. And this is just one of the examples. It's a real example, real data. And uh, it, it really falls quite well into normal distribution with certain parameters. All right, so what is interesting is, I think it would be very interesting, um, read notes for this lecture. There are some references to raw data and um, the picture which presents the, the histogram and another spreadsheet which presents the calculations based on these 30 bins and frequencies, etc., whatever goes into the histogram. Um, well, maybe you can just read it yourself first, whatever I have calculated, and then try to do something similar um, as, as a very good practice um, with, with something else. doesn't really matter. You can take, for instance, the data from the same site. There are many, many points 
uh, not only the, the Midway Island where, where I took it from, there are many points which you can actually use. And that would be, you know, very, very great. I think it's very educational. It will really make you feel what exactly the statistical research is about. That's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.